AG say he knew you. I said, well, until he get on the show, I ain't going to believe it. So uh, you, you done gave him a notch on his belt today. I'm like, all right, we'll take it. We'll take it. Me and, uh, me and Arthur, we met um, 2007, actually, believe it or not. We played, wow. we played yep. an exhibition game. And for me, wow. for me, it was full circle moment because, you know, I was such a big fan of Hoop Dreams growing up. You know, it's like when I really think of my childhood and the hardest hitting, most inspiring basketball things for me, like on my way up, it was like Hoop Dreams, Allen Iverson, Michael Jordan, and and one mixtape. So when I met him in the, I remember I met him in the elevator. We were both headed to a game, like an exhibition game on Vegas. And for me meeting him and him, him, for him to know me was a shocker. You know, I'm only like 22, 23 at the time. And then, uh, you know, it was like a full circle moment. So it's awesome. Glad to be on with both you guys. Will, I was a fan of you too, man. So this is this is hey, awesome. Man, you just gave a mountaintop right there. I'm like, you went hoop dreams, <laughs> AI, Jordan, yeah. Air yeah. One mixtape, man. That's 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 a <laughs> that's a mountaintop right there, man. But I'm that's I feel like that was for everybody too. You might not hear it because you guys are you living it firsthand, you know what I mean? But I feel like for a lot of America, that was you y'all were in that 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 childhood of inspiration coming up, you know, for the nineties. So Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. The man joining us today comes from Pelza, Oregon. Yeah. He starred. Let me let me say that correctly. He starred and took it to the next level on the and one mixtape tour and the ball up tour he played in the cba and ibl and has been in a number of movies and most recently if you haven't you better go check it out the endless sad sandler project hustle on netflix where you'll see him doing some professor type moves up in there you guys know him as the professor we like to welcome to the hoop dreams podcast grayson butcher i'm will gates and that's my dog Arthur A.G. Man, thanks for coming on the show, P, man. I appreciate you, man. This is going to be epic, brother. Hey, humble, man. Humble. Thank you guys for having me on, man. This has been in the making for a minute, too, so I'm glad we could finally commence. I was saying this earlier, man. A.G. said he knew you, but, you know, until you got on the show, man, we I, 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 I had some doubts that he knew the professor, so now I got to believe everything he say now, man, so. When did you actually see the movie Hoop Dreams and what were your thoughts? So Hoop Dreams, I know it was filmed. I know for you guys it was filmed. A lot of it was like early 90s. What, what year did it actually drop? I forget what year it actually came out. I think. I think 94. 94. Yeah. So I think I saw it like, like close to when it came out, like maybe like 95, I think. Because I remember I saw it a few years before I saw like Animal Mixtape Volume 1. At that time, I'm like. A fan of MJ, you know, I was always a Michael Jordan fan. He he like got me interested in basketball in the late '80s, and then uh, by the time I saw Hoop Dreams, it was right around the time I think I, I saw Allen Iverson be a rookie in the NBA. And so like I'm just lit. Everything I see is inspiration. I'm just like living it. So I'm going to the park thinking about Hoop Dreams. I'm thinking about Allen Iverson. A couple years later, it's Animal Mixtape. But no, it was something I actually watched. Uh, I think my parents uh, put me and my brother onto it, and uh, for us. It was an interesting watch because, you know, we're from the we're from Oregon in the suburbs. And so seeing your guys struggle, yeah. you know, in Chicago was just like such a different world and kind of like uh, kind of motivated me because you guys were kind of like you had all that adversity coming up. And like my adversity was different. Right. It's not it's not South Side of Chicago adversity, but it's like nobody gave me a chance adversity because I was so tiny. So I so mm -hmm. it inspired me and it hit my heart. You know, what I mean, that, that you guys could like flourish and succeed through all that adversity. And I had my own. So like I could relate to it on a lot of levels. And I think a lot of people can. Right. Because everybody kind of sees their own adversity. Yeah. So we all kind of think we're underdogs. We can be moved by that. So yeah. that was kind of my thoughts watching. It. Man, that's dude. What, what I loved about it was that it actually showed because at that time in the 90s, we only heard. And things was only written about other cities and they basketball or they high school. There was, there was never actually any footage put to a, a screen to where you was able to see Williams high school, St. Joe's high look, you know, them getting on the bus, 
uh, and that's what, and that's a suburb school. Then coming to the city and seeing a Chicago school, showing the trains, us traveling, you know what I'm saying? That whole shit just to get to school and play basketball. No one had never seen it like that before. And I think, I think that's what holds true when you say, man, man, look at that struggle, man. Look, look at the whole, you know, that whole thing just to, just to, you know, live your dream of trying to play basketball. And not even to mention the guys that you got to go up against. I know. It also kind of even for me watching it, I'm like, man, these dudes had to go through a lot. You know what I mean? Like if, if somebody makes it out of there, like no wonder they had to want it to the next level to get there and play against way harder competition. So it was, it was super eye opening, bro. And, and you know, really probably even like indirectly paved the way for a lot of like, you know how there's a lot of, uh, High school is magnified on a whole different level now. Who ball is life and all that other yeah. stuff. It was almost like that was the first. That was the first yep. to kind of view that uh, on a deeper level. So, I know AJ and I. We talk about this all the time, man. We we want to go back and get one of them NIL deals so that we can uh, <laughs> we can make a few dollars off of that thing. But it's, sure. it's interesting yeah. that you say that because um, you know I remember in 1994 when it first came out, man. And I want to get some credit to this because I actually think it helped Hoop Dreams. But when I remember being at the theater and I was watching Above the Rim, going to see the movie, and right Ooh. before that, they played the trailer of Hoop Dreams. And I'm just like, man, you got to be kidding me. Mind blown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. How lit was that? Damn, mid-90s were lit, bro. You had Above the Rim, Hoop Dreams. Damn, all the same. New Jack City. I mean, you go on and on. When they first, when they first approached us about it, it was supposed to be a, a, a two week documentary, thirty minutes on PBS about how kids go from street ball to organized basketball, and then they came back was like, we think we got something. Could we follow you guys a little bit longer? And that eventually turned into Hoop Dreams. But AG and I, we were still saying, man, who care about our life? You know, we, you know, right. he from the west side of Chicago. I'm from Cabrini. Don't nobody care about, you know, who's going to watch this? Like, do what you do. That's wild. Yeah. And I, I always thought about that, too. I was always like, this thing is like too brilliantly like done. I'm like, they, they just chill with cameraman all the time. Like, I never understood it when I was younger watching it. You know what I mean? And then later, you know, you, you see how, how like docu style stuff is made. And it's like, OK, I, I bet the parents were, you know, what I'm saying kind of organized. I'm like, that's a trip. But y'all feel like y'all probably just got used to it, right? The camera always, always around everything. Yeah, me, me and Will used to sneak away all the time. Absolutely. Couldn't give them everything, man. Couldn't get everything. But listen, man, I want to digress because this ain't about AG. This ain't about Gage. This is about the professor. And, man, what, what I want to do is, you know, our, our podcast is a little bit different. We, we'd like to know you as the person. We want your origin story. So take us back to... Kelsey, am I saying it right? Kelsey, Kaiser, Kaiser, but don't trip. Nobody mess Kaiser, that up. Kaiser, Oregon. I ain't gonna mess, never mess that up again. Kaiser, Oregon. Take us back there, man. What what was your neighborhood like? And describe it a little bit for us. So Kaiser, Oregon is uh, it's a tiny suburb town. It's like one of them signs you just see off the freeway. If you're taking the five, you know, what I mean, we're halfway halfway in between Portland. And Eugene, which is where like U of O is, which is a small, tiny town. You would pass the sign. It's uh it's suburbs, but it's like right on the edge of the country. So like you go five, six, seven minutes out outside of my neighborhood, you looking at cows and stuff like that. So so it's a real just like random small town. Uh but I had a great upbringing. My parents, they own like a jewelry store in that hometown, and it's still going today. It's like a family owned business. So we did pretty good growing up. You know, when I was born, we were like, I think we were like lower middle class by the time I graduated high school, probably upper middle class. But my parents were awesome. They supported my hoop dream, <laughs> quote unquote, my hoop dream to the next level. You know, as far as like putting me in kin clinics and camps, I always had like, you know, dope b-ball shoes. I had a trainer I started working with when I was in fourth grade. Uh, this guy's name is Rocky Howard. He was dope. He, he taught me like the first couple moves he taught me were like in and out. In and out crossover, and then the Iverson crossover. So this is like '96 or something like that, and I I mastered those moves in like a couple weeks. But all I did was play ball. Really, I played ball, you know, five to ten hours a day, depending on if it was the weekend or a school night or whatever. And uh, right away at like fifth, sixth grade, 
I'm crossing over grown men with that with that crossover. But it's crazy because I literally like I always look like 10 years younger than my age. You know what I mean? Like even when I was 18 on hand one, I look like I was 12 years old. So he would bring me out. I, I remember I would go to uh, I remember going to the Pro-Am uh, in Portland. He would take me up there and like a few NBA cats there like Jason Terry, Cliff Robinson, a few guys. And he would show me off to like the, the players and be like, yo, do that crossover. You know what I mean? And so I'd cross people over and they'd be like, oh, shit. Like we never seen, you know what I mean? Because I was on that first wave of people who had individual trainers. Like now it's like so common, right? You got that individual yeah. private trainer or whatever. So that helped me a lot. And then coming up through school, I was always an underdog. You know what I mean? Like always I had crazy offensive skills, but I looked so young. And then defensively, I wasn't very physical. So I always had a hard time getting opportunity. But I was always <clears throat> uh, just living basketball. And then by the time I got to um, – Junior year was the first time, like, I didn't start. I got held back on the JV team, and that was, like, a big hit to my identity because, like, you know, I'll, I'm the basketball guy. So not play varsity. Junior is like, oh, man. And then I transferred to a small school uh, after that for my senior year. It was a Christian school. I just went there just for better opportunity in basketball. And then I uh, ended up having a good year. It was, like, second team all state. But I was still only, like, 5'8", you know, I was small, 5'8", 110 pounds, 115 pounds. And then, uh, so Pete, let me ask you this though. You, when you say, I mean, you learning, I mean, you about fourth grade, fifth grade, I mean, you already doing these moves and stuff. How was, how was, how was your, your elementary school coach? Like, did he say like, Oh, I need this guy on my team. Like where you been at? Like how, how did the coaches treat you in those early years of you, you know, coming into your, you know, coming into your home? Oh, so ele elementary, we had it on lock. We we're, were good. You know what I mean? Nobody's really playing no physical defense when you're young. So, like, the crossover, my, my skills got me by, and I, would always, I was always, like, the starter on the team. But I remember, like, as I got older, <clears throat> it's interesting, too, though, because in the suburbs, that whole, like, Princeton offense vibe was, was really heavy back then, especially in the 90s, you know, the way they played. So they didn't really – like, my individual skills, by the time I got to and one, AO and them was like, yo, you you in school? Like, we playing D1? Like, where you at? And I was like, D1? I could barely even get on the floor at JUCO. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they, they didn't know. It was looked at totally different. So, like, my skills were, like, actually really, like, undervalued. And they even made me think, like, I wasn't that good. It made me think that, like, elite-level basketball didn't have time for that. It was, like, it was looked at Are as you serious? too showboat. Yeah. It was, it was looked at as very showboat. And then the coaches didn't trust it because they don't even know how to teach it. You know what I mean? So, like, they would mm -hmm. teach, you know, jab steps, you know, shooting and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I was good all the way up until junior year. I was a starter on the team. Then junior year, I got held back on JV because the gap between maturity, uh, my peers were mature and heavy. I still looked like a little kid. And so right. that senior year, though, I got to flourish. I went to this small Christian school, and the coach, he had played college ball. He was, like, a good hooper. So he he liked my talent. He was like, oh, let's go crazy. Like, we run 1-4 flat, like, Five times in a row, you know what I'm saying? Like, get a bucket, he'd be like, right. do it again. Get a bucket, it'll go crazy, you know, expose the mismatch. So that was cool. And then after I got done there, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a little, I don't know how it works. So I'm thinking, like, I'm going to have mad college offers because I'm one vote away from MVP of the league, second team all state. I average like right. 25 and seven, but I got no offers. JUCOs, community college don't even look there because I only had 300 kids in the whole school. So, Damn. yeah, so I tried out for three, uh, three community colleges, went to the open gyms or whatever. And I actually went crazy at all of them, but I just looked like I was 12 years old. So it was like hard for them to trust. You know what I mean? And socially, I couldn't even really, I didn't talk like, like a, like a college student. I talked like a middle schooler, you know? So really? Yeah. So I got cut. So did a uh, coach didn't take a chance on you. I got, I got them three, them three schools you tried out for a coach did not take a chance. on no, you. No, it was the same thing. Every time they, they told my pops like, Hey man, this kid's got some offensive skills, man. We really dig that. But like, we just don't think he can match up at this level. And so by the time, uh, I got, I got waived from three of them. And then the local community college, which I didn't really want to go to because I wanted to get out of town. I wanted to get away from my parents. My pops mm -hmm. persuaded the dude was buying jewelry for my pops at the jewelry store. And so he persuaded him, like, he's like, man, my kid's got a pass for the game. You got to check him out. And this coach was actually nice enough. I don't even know how, because this dude was like a hard ass. He was like a Bobby Knight type coach. So he actually gave, he, he watched me play at an open gym and he let me redshirt. You know what I'm saying? And then just right before the season, three, three guards got injured. So I had to dress down and I played like 
three minutes a game, like every other game. If it was close, like I definitely ain't going in. You know what I mean? Mm. And so that was my high school run. And then after that, we improved like like after that um, that next spring summer after my first year, I improved like three hundred percent. Though I started lifting weights, just matured late. You know what I mean? And then Amwin was having tryouts by about that time. I think that's the first time, Will, that I'd have heard a daddy barter his son yeah. through, the, through the family business. That's it, man. He was like, yeah, you gotta look at my son. That's probably the first time you heard it live, but it's been done before. That ain't the first time it's been done, though. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that, man, because your skill set is so off the chart. Who who put that basketball in your hand? Like, you know, just thinking where you're from, where, where did that passion birth that? Oh, it was from my pops, man. My pops, he put, we had pictures, two years old, put the basketball in my hands. And then I had like a Larry Bird Nerf hoop we always used to hoop at. And then, you know, I tried to shoot around the driveway. We lower the hoop or whatever. But yeah, my pops, you know, he, he didn't play college or pro, but he was like a really good, just like pickup player. And like he played men's leagues. And so his passion for the game would just wore off on me. Like I was even like in third, fourth grade, I'm watching his games intently while the other kids they run around the bleachers you know what I mean? like i was at his men's league game right. like locked in and so he was my idol to begin with and um you know it still is but that's that's who you know inspired the whole thing does your brother play my bro play my bro was a beast he was actually a better high school college player than i was he went to that school that i transferred to my senior year it's called salem academy christian he went there all four years he's a varsity player his whole high school run and then he played at a uh, westmont college out here um, and now he's actually the head coach at the college. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah, my brother. He's, right he's four years old. What position he played, Pete? <clears throat> he played the two. He played the two. He was like a shooter. He could, like, shoot for, like, he's, like, it's funny because before Steph Curry did that thing where he just shoot the ball from anywhere, like, that's how my brother was. The coach actually let him shoot for, like, five, six feet behind the line, and he'd go crazy. So, wow. Yeah, he was nice. Yeah. Man, that's, yeah. that's, that's so amazing. My, my, my other question for you is just adding on to that. Yeah. Dad gave you the love. Dad gave you the passion. But but it takes a little bit more than that to become the professor. So I got two questions for you. My first question is, if you're the professor, what does your dad call himself? Because it's, I know you got to I know you got to call himself something. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you even ask that. You know, on the ESPN show, they actually gave a nickname to Jeweler, a.k.a. the Jeweler. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, like, you know, nicknames were just, like, super hot at that time. You know what I mean, right? Everybody everybody was getting a street ball nickname. They giving themselves their own, even though in that time you're supposed to get it given to you. But when the TV show aired, I'll, it was, like, the first episode he flew out to watch me. I remember it was in New Orleans, and they were interviewing him, just asking him about my game and how it came about. And it said Steve Boucher, a.k.a. the jeweler. So we were crying. <laughs> he, 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 like, we joke around, like, the jeweler, let's go. I love it. I love it. I love it. And part two to that is, um, have you and your dad ever played against each other? Oh, man. We we always he, – he's the one who really – like, I would say that trainer I had, Rodney Howard, he was super dope. You know, he played D1. He was 5'7". He played – he was roommates with Gary Payton at OSU. So he brought me high-level teaching uh, as far as beating the opponent off the dribble. But my pops – was the one who built the toughness. We play one on one in the driveway forever. And I'm mm. mad. Like I was always super competitive. I could never beat him. I never beat him until I was like a senior in high school. Wow. Wow. You know, we always had this joke too. We would play and like he'll beat me and I get mad. I always get super mad like I was supposed to win. And then like I'll drop kick the ball, kick it all crazy. I'll I'll walk up the street. Like there was a I live by the elementary school I went to. It was like up the street. It's called Gubster. So my parents used to joke when I got mad. They're like, "What you gonna do? You gonna run to Gubster?" It's like I'll get mad and run up there. Like, will they? Will they played out that he got game sent? I know, yeah. right? For real, oh, no, I mean. verbatim. But that was like weekly. It was like weekly. <laughs> but I think my pops, you know, he was mad competitive himself, so he didn't want to lose. But I think also he he built a lot of toughness in me. I got so good at playing one on one. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so much value. Mm -hmm. And just playing one on one and being able to compete with somebody that's like a foot taller than you, you know? Like for me now, when I play, if I match up with somebody, like I won't really, in my mind, I won't really think they're tall until they're like six, four or taller or something, you know what I mean? Like if they're six, three and under, okay. I'm only five, ten, I feel like we're the same height, you know? I'm just used to that, you know, from a defensive standpoint and offense. If they six, six, it don't matter. Your, 
you can make one little herky jerk move and throw him off. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like how your game is now. A 6'6", six, six, a taller player, they you, you can just do one move how your game is now, and they going to shift. I, I can't wait for that. You know what I mean? Especially the switch moment. You can't wait for that. I mean, me back, matching up on D in the post, mm-hmm. that might be a little tough, but I'm, I'm definitely going to – I got my hacks ready to go too, though. You know what I mean? People don't know. I'm mad physical. I want, I want to ask you, man, it, it, it takes a lot to become the professor. First of all, one of the coldest nicknames in the game. But it takes a lot to become the professor, particularly like during your high school journey. Talk to us about the perseverance, because you spoke on it a little bit. You know, you was playing, and then you, you know, you went had to go to JV. Talk about the work ethic and the perseverance, man, especially for our younger listeners who going through that high school journey, man, they may get stuck and don't know what to do. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because, like you said, the younger, you know, the crowd, the parents always ask me, like, how much does my kid need to practice to dribble like you or to, to play at your level? Like, if I want to play, D, he wants to play D1, I was playing the pros. And I was like, honestly, you know, and you guys know this, it was never mapped out like that for me. For me, I just love the game so much. That's all I wanted to do. And so my parents were trying to figure out how to get me to play less because <laughs> my parents were like, this might be unhealthy. Like, you don't socialize. You don't, you don't got no girlfriend, you don't, you don't hang out, you don't go to the Friday night football games. All you do is hoop. It's like, it's almost like I was a nerd for basketball, you know what I mean? So all I did was hoop, like literally I said five to ten hours a day, that's literal. Some school nights, you know, if you had homework, some go on, might be only like two or three hours, but weekends, I just lived at the gym. My parents would drop me off there. Whoever worked at the gym was my babysitter, just by default, you know what I mean? And so... That's it. But like, that's all I wanted to do. You know, I just, I, I think in the nineties was the first time people really started like lifestyling. Like we lifestyle ball, right? Like I remember I went to high school dressed and I said, I had some Rashid Wallace air force ones, the, the tall patent leather black ones. And I had like a Jordan, Jordan sweats and a Jordan shirt. And people always used to clown me. They're like, what you going to hoop? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are you, why are you dressed like that? Cause that, now it's like, like, that's normal. Right. But back, you know how it is back then yeah. I was, even yeah. you, you guys like like Arthur. I remember you rock you rock some Jays on there. I always thought that was fly how you rocked them lifestyle. But it really just goes to show I was really just lifestyling basketball. So for these younger listeners, people got to know that if you're not you know six seven and windmilling just off genetics, you're gonna you're gonna have to mm-hmm. lifestyle the game because you have to love it so much. You have to practice that much. It's what's gonna take to get your skill level all the way up to be able to play at the next level. For most people, I would say, though, even like, Will, Will, you were mad talented, right? You Not that you didn't, of course, you practiced, but some people are just more talented than others. But I say majority of people, they're going to have to really spend that time in the gym to master the craft and work harder than anybody they know. You know what I mean? You know, after them, after them schools passed on you, man, like, you know, and I know you still got the love and the passion in, in you to play. What was, what was your next, what was your next move? What was your next plan? You know, it's funny. I never had a plan B. That's the funny thing. Like, I, I got cut from these community colleges. I still think I'm making the league. Like, I, I'll i be sad for, like, a day. You know how it is. I'm sad for a day. Right. But then I, they had, like, this street ball court in downtown Salem I used to play at. I used to go to this gym in my hometown, Kaiser. And I was like, every mm-hmm. time I went there, though, it's funny. This was God's plan for me to do what I do now because mad crowds always used to come watch me play. But I didn't think anything of it. I was just – when I would go play, it was just showtime was natural. You know what I'm saying? People – People going crazy was natural. So the next day after I'm sad, I have a down moment. I go back and go crazy and people at the park. And then I'm, I'm like back on top, my confidence back up like 24 hours. I'm, I'm back ready to go. So I'm still thinking I'm going to the league, but really what happened from there was I finally got the chance to play at Juco or community college. And I always, I'd always thought I was the best player on my team. You know, I played a couple minutes a game. I just knew that the challenge for me was like, I looked so skinny. I was so small. And then like, I barely just went through puberty, you know what I'm saying? Like senior year of high school, I just went through puberty. That's crazy, right? So yeah. I knew the dudes were stronger than me, which had me a little bit like tentative on a defense. But then after that freshman year, I hit the weights and then I stepped it up. I practiced even more. I remember my coach, he was like, get in here in the morning, 5 a.m. I want you to make a thousand jumpers before class or 500 jumpers, something like that. So I, and, I, and that stretched me, right? So I did that, and I'm hitting the weights in the afternoon, and I'm playing, like, twice a day, open gym and skill work. Mm-hmm. And, like, my, I just shot up. Like, my skill level just went through the roof. And then, 
by the time those open gyms were going on, my team would just hold court the entire time. We had guards that were going D2, D1, and uh, mm-hmm. even D1 coaches were coming in there. They're like, who's this kid? You know what I mean? Like, we didn't, we came to watch somebody else, but they're like, who's that? And then right. and one was having trials that summer, and I was more into and one than I was, like, regular ball at that time. So I went to try out. Right. And I really went as a fan, though. I didn't think I could be a part of it. I didn't even know about that contest they were having. So I just went up there yeah, yeah. just to watch Hot Sauce and AO and my idols go crazy. And then they're having trials. I was like, oh, I might as well hop in this. Let's see what's good, you know? <laughs> and then uh, Hold that thought hold that thought right there, Pete, because we want to break into a halftime with you. And when we come back, we want to get we want you to get that, that real true raw story yeah. on how you broke into and one. We got a halftime special for you. Tell them, Will. Hey, listen, man, we do this thing called halftime. We're going to throw some quick hitters at you. And... Yeah. Um, the first question, man, I want to hit you with is, who is the toughest player that the professor has ever had to had to guard? Mm, I'm going to give you two. And this is outside of NBA. I'm not going to talk about the NBA players I worked out against or played against, just because there, it was only for like a game or two. But the hardest people that I had to go against that I did multiple times was my big bro, who you guys had on, Skip to My Lou. Mm. Mm. And uh, my other bro, Bone Collector. Uh, those are two two toughest cats I ever had to like go you know, mul- multiple times, right? I played against Skip maybe five, six, seven times. And I played against Bone a bunch of times at practice and then like, a couple games, you know what I mean? So mm. I give you those guys. But I mean I could go a lot of ways with that. We could say AO, we could say any any of the other OG uh teammates that I had, and then also like from an NBA standpoint, Drew Holiday was the toughest defender I ever played against. You know what I mean? Like I did a couple workouts in the summer with him. And then uh, there was another NBA cat from Baltimore. I, I, I'm forgetting his name right now. On Ball Up, I played a matchup with him one time. That was, that was a dope matchup. But, yeah, Bone, Bone and Skip. And, and, by, and when I did match up with, like, Skip, I'm, like, 19. or he's in the league. So, like, it was super mismatch. I didn't know what to do. But then Bone, just all the way through, he always been a tough matchup. Who was the guys in the NBA that you modeled your game after? First one is, uh, well, actually, you know what, going all the way back, you know, being in Oregon, my dad's a diehard Blazer fan, so I was too growing up. So actually, uh, Rod Strickland was one of the first players I tried to emulate. And then it kind of was like Tim Hardaway. And then it morphed to, obviously, MJ. I couldn't really play like MJ, you know what I mean? But everybody, MJ was the idol. So the mid-range, I got my mid-range from MJ. And then uh, Allen Iverson, once Iverson hit, and my, my trainer showed me the, the Iverson crossover, I was, I was all, I was either, I was Allen Iverson and I was Ant one. So I was like a little bit of hot sauce, headache, AO, mixed, mixed with. Ooh, give me I, a little pot of gumbo in there, baby. Yeah, that, but that's that's a funny thing, though. That's what shaped my game today. I'm a hybrid of all my Ant one OGs. Like a lot of our trick moves, they're from a little bit of everybody mixed with like, you know, mm. <clears throat> my favorite guards in the league, but. Rob Strickland slept on, man. He was like, oh, you know, he inspired Kyrie and all these other, you guys know, right? They do was a beast. Yeah, he, he played he, played here in Chicago at Deep Park. Yeah, he slept on from oh, us. That's you, right. You, okay, you know him. <laughs> okay, so that's right. I'm not even thinking that it's in Chicago for college. I ain't know that. Yeah. Now I'm about to hit you with a tough one here, though, man. And it may not even be tough for you. You might say, "Well, that ain't enough. It's, it's it's way more." But give me three guys that played on the N one tour that you said, you know what? These dudes should be in the league. Uh. There's dudes that could. There's always a reason they're not in the league, though, right? I, I don't. I actually don't. Oh yeah, always. I, don't, I actually believe people who don't make the NBA should. Like, there's always something that hold, held them back. Sometimes luck of the draw. Sometimes it's injury, but very little, right? So I think if AO, I think if AO wanted to be in the league, he could have, for sure. I think what's holding him back though too is the same thing that held me back when I played the CBA, which is like the old G League. Streetball had a bad reputation at the time. It was kind of like circus basketball and i think that was because of and one hot sauce mm-hmm. hot sauce came in the game with the illegal moves and he brought it to a whole new level because he was incredible like one of the best entertainers of all time but he also brought a different spin to it where illegal moves became a trend and it kind of gave it a different look whereas like rucker park if you went to rucker back in the day it was just basketball outside it may have had a little bit of a sideways look toward like gms and high ups and basketball but was, it just changed the narrative, right? So I think that that wasn't helping for AO, but he won like a championship in the D League. And he was like, when NBA players would come 
play with us, it was like seamless. You know what I mean? A O and them, they're going back and forth. You wouldn't know who's in the league mm. if you if you didn't know those mm. players, right? So I would say A O. I know Prime Objective, who a lot of people don't know. He he went to camp with teams in the league. If you watch the the game with Kobe at Rucker, it's Prime and Kobe. It's basically the Prime and Kobe highlight tape. You know what I'm saying? He diamond Kobe, Kobe diamond him. Uh, wow. So he was a super beast. I think um, a lot of guys, man, were nice. Uh, I'm trying to think. It's hard to say. There's more than three, right? Because I can tell you that, like, Ali Moe, if Ali Moe would have, like, worked on a jump shot a little bit and then been more, had a better headspace, you know what I mean? Like, he kind of tried to follow what Skip did. Like, because, you know, Fresno State recruiters came to Rucker looking for sleepers, you know what I'm saying? And they they got Rafer, they approached Ali Mo, and something happened there where he didn't want to go. You know, he never really wanted to leave Harlem like that. So Yeah. But it, but then I could even I could even point to Headache was bad nice too though. Headache didn't get a lot of opportunity, but he was really good too. So a lot of dudes uh played at that level, I will say. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. there may have been something that held them. Maybe maybe it was simply a lack of opportunity, but some held him back from not being the NBA, and I think the reputation of streetball didn't help. But all of them had the skill set. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. Everybody had the skill set to play on the next level. I mean, yeah, they and were I'll be amazing honest. talents. Yeah, they really were. And, you know, when NBA players would come play with us, they literally thought they were better. And you got to have that as a hooper, though, right? Like, I was probably the only... That's your edge. That's your edge. That's your edge, right? Even when I played, like, I would never say it because I was too, like, you know, puppy eyed and these guys were my idols. But even when I played in my head, I'm I'm like, I'm getting the best of the matchup tonight. And <laughs> you know what I mean? So Yeah. So yeah, that's really what it was like. And I think like that documentary that came out recently about An one, that was unfair, you know, the, the viral clip about the NBA players talking, uh saying like they were laughing oh, yeah. they couldn't play in the league. But it's all about how that question was asked. We don't know what question was asked, right? That was unfair. They yes, they weren't in the league, there's probably a reason, but they swing too wide. I don't even know why that was on the dock, to be honest. I don't know why that was on the dock. Baron Davis says some, Kyrie says some. Yeah. It's like, oh, like, like, could have, like, could have, and one dude, a street ball player, you know, could he, could he actually play in the NBA? And I don't even know, you know, Iman Schumper said he went to the pro am and got did up, but like, that never happened while I was there. I, I, don't, I don't think, he, remember, he going off his dad's story. His dad could have been an and one hater. There was a lot of them too. I really don't know. Right. It's like hot sauce. May not have been fundamental, but you know when he was when I was going on there, he was killing the pro ams because like nobody could nobody knew that style of play, right? I saw him kill NBA players, and I saw him kill yeah. D one overseas, like because you know he couldn't keep up. It was, it was so brand new, you know what I mean? You don't know how to guard it, and he was fast. You know what's so crazy about this though? It's like it's like there's two different things they're talking about because to me, most of the league has been built on playground legends, playground guys that came up. That's how you built your name. That's how you built your reputation. But now it's like, it's, it's almost like the question is, yeah, these are the guys that played in the playground, but then these are the guys that, you know, was on the and one tour. As if that's like a, you know, a different set. I'm like, no, playground ball is playground ball. They just did it a whole lot better <laughs> than a lot of your average <laughs> playground ball players. Yeah, and that's and that was the truth of and one like like zooming out now looking at it, I'm like wow the talent level we didn't we didn't quite realize how the talent level of the original and one squad was crazy because everybody always tells me today like yo why don't you bring back and one do your own tour and like don't get me wrong I'm gonna do a rendition of it but it won't be the same because and one was actually just the all stars from every region so it'd be like if you took the best players from Rucker the best players from the Drew League which was like sick with it and Spin Master. The best players from Chicago, it was Flash and whoever. The, the stars from the Atlanta was 50 was like the best player in the Pro-Ams. Hot Sauce was the best exhibition player. You know, D.C., mm-hmm. we had like Baby Shaq was the best player in D.C. Not in, the best players not in the NBA, but at that time, Showtime was a little more trendy. So they all had Showtime to their game and played at a, at a high level just below the NBA. So like, yeah, you know what I mean? It, it, the, the talent was off the charts, you know what I mean? So – yeah, that whole thing on the dock, that was unfair, man. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Hey, AP, what's your favorite three and one sneakers? Ooh, uh, I know two off top, the Tai Chi. Uh, you know, the Tai Chi, I actually wore my senior year in high school before I was even on and one. I was lifestyle and one. 
I had the gray ones, but you know, Vince had those white red ones. Those are cold. Uh, they had these chosen one, the chosen one mids. They had they had like the little holes in it. They were like mid top with a strap. Um, I like those. And then, dang, the third one, you know, third one, the first ever slip ons. They were called like to chillings. Those were hard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those still hard. They need to figure out how to get them back out though. Those are still hard. You know, they've retroed them a few times, but you just don't, people don't keep up with the and one narrative. You know what I mean? But this is a tough one here, man. Favorite three cities that you had to go play at that you, that you love playing at on the and one tour. Ooh, uh, well, New York, you know, for street ball, you can't beat the enter the crowd energy in New York. Although you definitely want to have a good showing because, like, if it goes bad, you're going to hear about it. Mm, that's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. I would say, like, <laughs> when we went to New York, if we played in, like, Harlem somewhere in the park or if we played in Madison Square, like, that's hard to top, right? That was the best. But Chicago, Chicago always had the Hoopers, man. And I don't even know what it's today because I'm not really at a street level going around like that. But New York, Chicago, and then third was either, like, a toss. It's like, D.C. or – uh. Or Detroit, you know what I'm saying? They have incredible talent. But I would say my favorite to go to was probably New York, Chicago, Miami. I just like Miami, you know what I mean? Like, you can't beat the vibe out there. That's right. That's right. L.A. was dope, too, but they weren't they weren't as into street ball when we went to, like, the arenas. Like, L.A. didn't really come out like that because it was too – L.A.'s too Hollywood. Mm-hmm. There's always an A-lister doing something every night that you're competing with. Right. I love L.A. now if I go, like, Venice or Laguna or something like that. That goes crazy, but mm-hmm. back then, yeah, I'd say New York, Chicago, Miami. I, I was gonna ask you what cities had a stronger basketball culture than than you thought. Oh, stronger than I thought. I'd have to go international for that one. Stronger mm-hmm. than I thought. Wow, basketball culture. I would say the strongest basketball culture in the world is actually like in the Philippines, like Manila, Philippines. I've never seen no city that loves basketball more than them. I'd say the skill level isn't. Mm. isn't as good as other places, but I, the Philippines was crazy. And then also the sleeper, uh, the sleeper today is like India, like basketball blowing up crazy. I went to India two years ago or three years ago, right before COVID. And it went, cra- it was, it went crazy. Like it was nuts. But, um, Japan low key, the, uh, what's it called? Tokyo got hoopers though. Like, like they're not as, uh, explosive as the, the elite, you know, like, the, like American hoopers, but they, they're just like good. You know what I mean? So, there's a lot of sleepers. I had to name one. I'd probably say the Philippines. You would you would underestimate it. Yeah. We've been hearing a lot about the Philippines and even some of the stuff we we had a guest on um a couple of weeks ago, man, was just talking about the tournament that they're getting ready to do. And man, it's almost gonna be like the TBT almost. Like so, yeah. yeah. He was just talking about the same thing you said, how great the crowd is that maybe I think he said, what do you say, AG? 51 to 52 percent? Yeah are like basketball nuts. I mean, insane, insane. And then uh, I heard Australia got a a big, a big basketball following. Australia does. Like they real deep down in Australia. Yeah, we used to go to Australia every year and have one. Like what I learned was that back in that day, that was like an NBA feeder league, the pro league in Australia. And I think it's still good today. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, Australia like going to, it's like the U.S. just remixed, you know what I mean? Like. Literally, so yeah, yeah. It's Australia, beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful city, Melbourne. I mean, it's it's beautiful out there. Trust yeah. me, it's beautiful out there. I, I feel you. Uh, <laughs> uh, man, I want to. We want to thank you for doing uh, halftime with us. Of course, but we want to jump right back into this thing, man. You know, and one changed the culture. Really mixed street ball, hip hop, and not just you know, the black culture, man, but all cultures, I think it opened up a whole new legacy of basketball to anybody who wanted to connect. So my question for you is, man, how did you get connected to that? I know you talked a little bit about it, but uh, how did you, were you discovered or you just went to this tryout? So the funny thing is the year before the year I was telling you, when I actually graduated high school, I actually so I was a big fan of Anwan since like 99, right? Anwan makes State Volume 1. Mm-hmm. I was hooked. Yeah. But by the time it, it came on ESPN and their first big tour was like 02, the year before I got on the team. But I actually went I actually went to the open run then, and I tried out, and I actually played against Team Anwan. And uh, I didn't really get – I didn't, I only got one move off. It's on Anwan makes State Volume 6, actually. My debut one was like Volume 7, saying I'm the professor. 
volume six, I actually have one highlight from that open run on, but uh, that motivated me a lot. And I, I remember going against sick with it. These dudes, my head was spinning. I'm like, this game was too fast for me. You know what I mean? But, <laughs> but you know, I got a chance to shine my hometown. I was like a superstar for a whole year, you know, cause I played against him one and then come the next year I went up there and I really didn't know they were having the contest though. Cause the con before it was like, just play against your idols that night. This one was, mm -hmm. we're taking you around the country. We're doing this survivor theme. You know, they got it from that reality show survivor. The first, the first reality show. See if you can last on the bus. Yeah. So I didn't know anything about that. So when it finished, main event them came in the room and i'm just sitting there getting dressed and they were like all right so the espn you know we, we came to our decision you know what i'm saying we're gonna take one of y'all with us on tour and, we, and i remember main events on the show he's like we want you and i didn't even know what he's talking about i actually didn't even know what he meant and so i was like <laughs> i was like okay okay like i didn't even, I didn't even know what he's saying so so after he left the room and the cameras dude came came to me he's like excited i was like what, what is it i was like what's going on what's going on and he was like he's like my boy you just i'm so puppy eyed i'm so like 12 years old he was like you just won you know you're gonna actually go on tour with that one man so you got to go home you got to get a background check for a week and then you're gonna meet us in phoenix you're gonna be in a contest you're gonna compete to win a contract with that one and then i immediately was like a little bit nervous but a little bit mind blown a little bit like i didn't know what to think you know what i mean that's how that happened if I was you, my confidence would have been through the roof. Yeah. I would have been like, that would have that would have validated what I was been you meaning thinking in your head, like, oh fuck, I am good enough. Yeah, you know the tr the trip about my career was though, being from An one, like sorry, sorry, being from Oregon, they made me think that like the elite level was something different, right? They made me think street ball was bad. And even though that's what I was ultra into, they made me think I wasn't mm -hmm. good. So even though I played, my confidence was high and all that, I actually thought if I zoomed out in a big picture, I really wasn't that good. So mm. by them bringing me on tour, I thought in my head, I'm like, oh, they like my showtime, you know, because I'm unique, my ball handling, but I'm still not. I still didn't think I was that good, right? And then, like, as we went on, I started to really realize, like, oh, man, I can't compete at this level. Like, maybe I am. You know, I was slow to learn it because I just been drilled in my head for so many years that, I'm too AAU, mm -hmm. I'm too street ball, I'm too whatever, and it's not, it don't match up with the highest yeah. level. So as I went through the summer, I started to slowly get my confidence up. And then there, there was a moment where I'm like, oh, dang, I could actually do this for a living. Like, I had a little battle with hot sauce in uh, Detroit. And um, I remember he came down, and, and this game in Detroit was crazy, right? Like, they stand in the whole game. So he shook me up. I, like, went, I took a knee. He shook me up so crazy. I, t I touched earth. And then I tried to like block his shot, but I missed it and it went in and they lost it, right? Like everybody ran on the court. Oh. So, and, this, and this one this one made the TV show. So I remember getting the ball back and I didn't know what to do because it's like that eight mile moment, but I'm on the I'm on the bad guy, so I'm on the loser side. So I was like, yeah. I remember my coach, he was screaming. He, his voice was so loud. Mike Ellis, he was like, go right back at him. You know what I'm saying? Right now, you go right back at him. So it's kind of like that moment, you know, like they push you on stage. I'm like, that. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. do your thing. So right. I literally came down in every move I knew, I did it right then on that position. I knew I had like five crazy moves, <laughs> boo, 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 boo. but it was God's plan. Look, it was God's plan because I did all these moves. Crowd lost it, right? They're like, damn, he go over. And then I did like this sham. I ended with like this sham. I threw the ball out and I kind of snatched it back. And House House got crossed though. He like, he kind of like wobbled a little bit. And then I went to the lane. Yeah. This, is how, this is how I know it was God's plan. I went to the lane. I don't even remember what happened after that. I threw the ball up, and I got leveled. I got, I got fouled so crazy. I threw this floater up just toward the rim. And then next thing I know, I'm by the base of the hoop. Like, I got, the, you know what I'm saying? I got knocked down. I can't, I don't even know what's happening, but it went in. I just know the, the, the crowd eruption was louder than it was when Hot Sauce scored. So I had like 20-plus points that game and a bunch of alley-oops and stuff. And I was like, really thought after this, like, Maybe this is for me, you know what I mean? But that was like 20 games in. Man, that's crazy. I know. Like, I like, know. like next level crazy. Like, man, every kid wants that moment you just described. That moment where you know you arrived. That moment where you know you belong. Like, that is like, to me, the ultimate hoop dreams. But you said something I thought was, was interesting, man. And I want to get a little bit more if you can just expound on this a little bit more. what What's that process like? You said you got to compete for a contract. Is there a signing process? Do you got to negotiate? Do you need an agent? 
what, what was the the business side of and one like so we go through the whole summer <clears throat> and it got down to Madison square garden I actually like hit a buzzer shot and we beat team and one and then there was two, there was two more games left. We played at White Kobe. I think Iverson was there. So I was like turned up, went crazy. And then the last game was in main events hood. They were like, the way they did it for the show was like, all right, you can do it with the commercial side, but can you do it in the hood? You know what I mean? That's how it was pitched. So we played in Linden, New Jersey. And again, I had another battle with hot sauce. Like I could never get over this, this battle. You know what I mean? So we went back and forth. I think that day I happened to get the best of him. Not that he didn't get the best of me a lot, but I got the best of him that day. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up winning a contract that day. And uh, it was surreal because even up until then, you know, I was up with Spider and Helicopter. And, you know, dudes were better players than I were than I was. But I just mm-hmm. happened to have these crazy games. So maybe they won. Right. I don't know. But it seemed that way to me, right? How Spider can, like, drop step windmill, you 5'8". You know what I mean? So I'm like, mm-hmm. it's crazy. But so I won the contract. And then we went home. And they, were, they flew us out to Philly, like, a couple weeks later. And my dad was my agent. And they gave me a contract. And my, my dad's mm. funny. He actually turned it away. He's like, nah, we need more. He's like, this is going to work, man. He's like, he, my pops is like, he's like, I feel disrespected by this. He's like, this is, like, this is bullshit. That's what he said. He literally goes, this is bullshit. Like, y'all going to have to do better. And he was like, the face got red. So I was like, oh, dang. And in my mind, I'm sweating a little bit. I was like, pops, we turning away the deal? Like, what, what you mean? Right. And so... Give me a new agent in here right now. Right yeah. now. At least- so I trusted it. And he was right, though. He was right, though. They tried to get us on the cheap. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, like for the marketing value we were bringing to Anwan at the time, it was a joke. Let, let me ask you this, Pete, because I got to interrupt you on this. And I got to ask, because at, at this time, you f- you about to do the contract, and social media is not is not like what it, what it was back at that time. Do you know that your popularity has grown? Yeah, I knew because uh, oh, this is a funny story too. This is so fun. So when the when the ESPN TV show debuted in the middle of that summer, right? It was only two weeks behind the tour. So when it de- debuted, I remember I was in a hotel room in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was watching the show. It was about to come on that season. This is season two, and one on ESPN. So I'm hoping I could like press pause to see myself. Mm-hmm. I'm, ma- I'm hoping one of my buckets made it. You know what I'm saying on the on the show because yeah. you know like. I was probably averaging like eight to 15 points, right? I ain't going crazy. I'm just hoping one of the buckets can make it, even though it was all showtime when I did score. So when it came on, I'm not thinking anything of it because it's really about team and one. So all of a sudden the show airs and I'm like the star of the show. And it's like, Oh crap. Like this is actually about the theme of the show is about the contest. Like I didn't anticipate that because season one was all about the guys, you know what I mean? And I'm like, in my mind, they're like the goats. I was like, we can't top that. So I literally was a star of that show in that hotel room that moment. And then I'm tripping out. You know, I didn't even know yeah. what to think. I was actually even like a little nervous, you know what I mean? And so the moment I left the hotel that night, I couldn't go anywhere without mobs of, you know, people asking for a picture, autograph and all. Like it literally happened instantaneously that night and the next day, like it's overnight, not even overnight. It was like that day. But I actually didn't realize in the culture, though, I didn't realize how mainstream it actually was, though. It was like, I think we all didn't quite know how big it was. Like, we all knew it was big and we knew it was like reaching other countries. But I think we we still looked at A-list as higher, but not knowing like if we would have had Hollywood PR, we could have been on Letterman. You know what I'm saying? But we in our contract, we couldn't do our marketing. So we actually couldn't have PR. We couldn't. We couldn't mm. go on a talk show. And one had to do that for us. Wow. Because it's just old school, old school music style contracts, right? They do all the marketing and endorsement. So I think zooming out, if I was to do it different, I would have tried to negotiate for my own PR and try to uh, be able to market myself a little bit more to tack on every day on ESPN. Like literally every day. And there's no streaming. There's no digital. This is cable. You know, I was, I was thinking, you changed the game in so, so many ways, man. How... How do you think and one either helped your career or did it not help your career as much? Oh, no, I, and one birthed me. You know what I mean? And one did a bunch of things. It showed me uh, first that birthed me on the on the global basketball scene, period. Right. To the culture. And then I just learned from my OGs, you know, like like I'm literally my game and my tricks and everything is like a hybrid of all my my OG teammates. So. They're actually upset with how it ended, right? As you can see in that doc. Oh, absolutely. 
you know, I'm not even in the doc. I was left out of it because they're a little upset about the way that N1 is remembered. It's remembered really for by the time it hit ESPN and corporate got involved. And a lot of those guys were X'd out unfairly. You know what I mean? We had like a, it's hard to explain, but we had a split in the company and those guys were left off and only me, Hot Sauce and Escalade were left on. So I understand they're hurt, but for me, I just feel like I was blessed just to be a part of it because it kind of like birthed me in the game. And then, you know, my social media, when it started, it wasn't really like super pop, but I did it more to get international bookings. It was all about, it was still about the live show. It wasn't fully about the content. So I did it just to get bookings. So I started my YouTube channel and all that, but I still was getting some viewership because people remember me from a few years before, even though like we were all forgotten, bro. Like, oh, nine, I remember going to college basketball games where I would have had to have security at two years, three years prior. Now, maybe one person would recognize me. You know what I mean? Like, people forgot about that. So I was branding out just because I was doing um, a lot of international games, but it would be like every other month. You know, we were like broke and forgotten about. So I started YouTube for that. You know, I mean, to get bookings. And then... Uh, it still helped me though. You know, some vids had 20k, some had 50k. I remember one video had a half a million, so it was still helping me a little bit. But by the time I got serious and had some viral content, then it went to the next level. And people don't even know we all struggle. Well, I can speak for myself, not my guys, but we struggle heavy for a little bit. Everybody thinks it was just a rise of the fame, right? We did and one, start digital, went crazy. But it's like, nah, it was like this. So uh, I would say and one definitely was maximum to the benefit for me. You know. Man, you more than on your way for that. I mean, shoot, I, I'm I'm watching all your videos on social media. I'm on Insta, I'm following you everywhere: Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I'm all on it. Humble, I, bro. Every view counts. I tell everybody, I'll stop and have a convo with anybody who supports. Man, so every view counts. Thank you, man. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to ask you, man, about your your non and one playing career. Cause I got so many questions about and one, like, man, I want to ask you professor, where did and one go wrong? I want to ask you, you know, yeah. uh, why didn't and one, uh, matter of fact, I, I, I even wanted to go deep with you and I didn't know how, how, how deep you wanted to go, but I want to even ask you on this level. Anything bro. Open book. Well, let's, let's go here for a minute. Then being the white guy on the tour, did you feel any pressure from that? or that you had to live to a, a certain type of, you know, stigma that's out there. Was there any of that you had to deal with? The whole thing was culture shock for me. You know, I had, I had, uh, I was really into urban culture growing up in a 90% white people culture, like in Oregon. But then by the time I got to college, like half my team was black. And I had one, I had like a black friend in high school, but it was, <laughs> You know, I didn't really know the culture like that. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. by the time I got on and one, there was pressure to perform at the highest level, but then also, yeah, to like fit in and then be some be somebody in the public eye. I just like learned that as I went. You know what I mean? Like like I said, I left in Jackson, Mississippi. That sh that show aired, and I it, it aired at like two p.m. And by the time I went out that night, I had to like be a star and just kind of like learn it. So yeah, I think the whole thing was pressure, right? And then, like, once we got, once I signed my contract, it was even more pressure. And that's what I really had more respect. I had so much respect for what my idols did and Alan and one of the OGs, but I have more respect for it because then you had to put on a show and win, but everybody playing you like it's the game of their life. And you just, it's another game on the tour for you. And then when I played pickup back home in my hometown, it was like everybody taking it super personally. You know what I mean? Like, even now, right? Like, I only play pickup if we're rolling for the vlog because I'm not even going to get it. I'm not going to get into you with it and act like, you know, because you got to be just as desperate to win as they are, right? So I had to relearn. I had to relearn how to approach basketball through that whole experience. So I did feel pressure. And as far as culture shock, it was on max. And then, like, one thing I will say, though, is that everybody was cool. I didn't – I didn't – uh, I didn't receive any bad feedback because of my race. You know what I mean? Like – I didn't, I didn't receive any of that, hardly at all. You know what I mean? My teammates so, really... So you never you never felt like, man... Because, you know, I, I hate to say it this way, but, you know, like guys, when they go to the league, you know, automatically, Luka Doncic, he's the next, you know, Larry Bird. It's like, you know, media and even culture tries to identify, you know, race with this race like that. So you never felt any of, of that or were you like 
considered like the white favorite? Like anybody say, oh, that's that's the next white chocolate right there. Yeah. Well, Jay Will and them were having their run at the same time. So we we're kind of like we we're kind of like in this, the same age. But uh, I think it was hard to it was hard to branch in as a regular. I still try to make the NBA, you know, played and one for a couple of years. And then I remember my coach, Steve Burt, you know, he played in the NBA in the 80s and, and even into the 90s. And he was like, he was like, yo, P, like, you ain't never trying to go to the league. Like, what's, what's good? And I was and then, I'm still in my mind. I never I never knew how good I was. I never knew it. So, like, I was like. You think I go to Lee? Like I remember asking that. He's like, like, "Come on, bro! Like, why would you not?" You know what I'm saying? And I was like, "Oh, I don't know." Like, you know. What I mean? So then, so literally after that, I tried to play. You know, I go back. I try playing the IBL. This is like '04 and '05. I played in the IBL, which is like the, the ABA. It was it was a you know minor league pro. It's not near like not near the G League or the NBA. So then. From there, I did good though. I like I averaged like eighteen and five when I got playing time, and then I went to the CBA, and I only played like six to eight games or something like that. It was all politics, you know. Kenny Anderson was our coach, and I was playing behind Zach Marbury, you know, Steph's mm. brother. I felt like I was a better player. Like, no knock on Zach. The Marberries and the Anderson were friends. Like, it's almost like part of the reason. K- K.A. was brought there was to help Zach get in the lead. They were like friends. Like, they literally were friends in New York, the family. So, and I respect that, too, though. It's not like, it's not like Zach wasn't nice, right? He played at uh, Providence or he played at Rhode Island or something like that, D1. Yeah, so I, I'm going against him in practice. Like, I felt like I was better, but he got injured one time. And I remember I played. I started three games in a row. And then we won two out of three. And we were just losing games before that. So, I remember one of the, one of the games I had, like, 23-5 and five or something like that. And then... We did good, and then as soon as he was healthy, I got relegated straight back to the bench, you know. And I, I thought that was weird. I was like, wait, now we got chemistry because he wasn't a chemistry guy, really, you know. And, like, I was like, we're doing good. So why am I not still starting? But then I had to learn politics, you know what I mean? And then mm-hmm. Kenny Smith's bros are assistant, and they were cool. Don't get me wrong, you know what I mean? They, they showed me love a little bit, but, you know, it was what it was. And then, like, the, the franchise stopped paying, so I just quit. I went back down. I was like, I ain't got time for this because – I came to a fork in the road. I realized, like, am I going to try to really make a run at the NBA? I was only – I think I was 25 at the time, 26. And, like, I was like, I'm kind of getting a little mm-hmm. old to try to, like, make a run at the league. And then also the politics. I'm seeing what this is. They frowning on that one. You know, I remember Kenny – Kenny, yep. K.A. Yep. was like, you know, he was like, professor, he was like, he was like, I would tell people you you could play. You know what I'm saying? I was like – I was like, that street ball shit, that ain't helping. He's, as we said, he said, that street ball shit ain't helping you. You know what I'm saying? But, like – but you could play. That, that was his attitude. But, like, I think he thought less of it. You know what I mean? So I, I, I was either battle that and try to go overseas and come in the NBA the back door because at that time I couldn't play in the G League. It was too old when it started. Mm-hmm. Or it was like, you mm-hmm. know, just stick with street ball, do something different. So I decided to do that. And then it ended. Which is, right. it was which is interesting week. that Kenny Anderson would say that to you when – the only clip they show yeah. Kenny Anderson when he does a little and one behind his back, boom, 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 against Bobby Hurley and lay it, and lay it in. Like, it's interesting that kids yeah. who, who are known for, you know, crossing, dribbling, you know, playing, playing below the rim would say that to you. Yeah, I think, like, I think Kenny, Kenny's just so good, right? Kenny's slogan on one of his, one of his books was, basketball is easy, but life is hard. So I think, like, for him, like, if you don't make the league, yeah. you ain't that nice. That's his – you know, he, he had a real elite view. I remember one time we passed him mm-hmm. – this is, like, years after the CBA, me and Escalade were going into some some club or something at All-Star Weekend, and he was leaving out when we passed him. And I think he looked at me. He was like – he was like, yeah, he was like, you got a handle? He said, he said, you got a little handle? He said, but I got handle. That, so that, <laughs> that, was, that was his viewpoint, you know what I mean? Like – Okay, Kenny, he had an elite viewpoint. I think, like, for him, like, it's always different viewpoints. I think the better, you know, sometimes people just have an elite mentality and have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder in the basketball world because it just depends who you talk to, right? right? Some of my teammates were like that, too. Some of my teammates, I'm not even going to say names, but some people, you know, I remember I had this argument with one dude about Anwan, and he was he got on Anwan toward the end, and he was trying to tell me that Anwan ruined basketball, and he was saying, like, yeah, this ain't real and blah, blah, blah. And I'm and and he was really saying, like, me and hot sauce, like, y'all, y'all curved basketball, whatever. And I'm like, 
I was at curb. Like I met D Wade and he thought he said it was incredible. You don't think LeBron had a mixtape? Steph asked me for a photo. I met Steph. Yeah. He asked me for a photo. Kyrie been following me since high school. So I'm like, what do you mean ruin ball? They came up during the street ball era. And then get this, his favorite player was Isaiah Thomas. Y'all favorite players. The OG legend, right? Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I met Isaiah Thomas in Miami. I ran into him one time. And he goes, man, he's like, you're a professor? This is like 2010. That one's over. And I was like, yeah. He's like, he's like man, you a legend, bro. Mm-hmm. He's like, man, yo, what y'all did for basketball? He said, that was incredible, man. He said, I never had a handle like that. Boom, boom. So that was his viewpoint. And that really, that was an eye opener for me. I just had to learn. Yep. Some people have a real, chip. some people in the basketball world have this real elite viewpoint that like, if you didn't stamp it in the league, you weren't that nice, you know, and that's kind of like where it rests. I'm not going to say Kenny was right. all the way there because he did yeah. show me a little love, you know, when we played. But yeah, I, you know, that's just, that was the, that was what I was battling if I was going to try to make the NBA. You know what I mean? It was. Hey, it's it's an important thing you saying, man, because I want all our listeners out here to understand everybody's journey is different in this game of life that I mean this game of ball life, you know, that we start. And yours it was no different. It it seems like you had obstacles at every at every turn of saying that you're too small. You 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 you're, you're a street ball player. It's you you found out it's politics and all this. I want all these shorties and these yeah. parents out here to listen to see what this man had to overcome to become who he is today. You know what I'm saying? He didn't stop. You know what I'm saying? You you didn't you 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 you, you there was some doubt amongst the journey, but all the things that you sat here and told me, and I'm just sat here and you know, it, it just you overcame all of this, and you're now here as the professor. I mean, doing movies, glad to go global hooper, you know, clothing line. It's just crazy, bro. And then you got Hall of Famers like Isaiah Thomas telling you that. Just God is amazing, good, man. Bro. Yeah, it was hum- humbling, man. Absolutely. Sure. You you got to share with us, man. How how did the movies come about? Because yeah, you and a lot of them. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's funny because so. 0405, this uh this producer writer by the name of Bryn Hills, cool cat. He 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 put a script in my hand. He was like, Hey man, I want you to play this character. It was like it was like after a game, I was going in the tunnel. He gave me the script. And I always stayed in touch with dude for like a couple years. He's like, I'm trying to get funding, man. I want you to play this lead, man. And it was a dope. This guy was awesome, man. You know, he really saw a vision for me in that. So I, I ended up moving I moved to LA 06 after I did the movie because you know, I was, I was like, oh, this is it. And then when Antwin, uh, you know, when it ended, I had filmed that movie. I was a lead role. And that movie mm-hmm. actually never came out, even though I had like mm-hmm. A-list cast and all that. But I learned a lot from it. You know, I took acting lessons for six, seven months, hopped in there and did a movie. And I didn't I didn't do the greatest mm-hmm. job because I was only 21, 22 at the time. But it kind of like opened my eyes to how I could brand out and try to branch into something different. So I actually really liked it. I always just like entertainment, mm-hmm. period, whether it's on the court or off the court. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I did that movie and then like I did semi pro, you know, there was an open, when I was in LA, that same, like, like we finished ball don't lie. And then they had an open casting for this movie semi pro. And I thought it was a serious basketball movie at the time. I didn't really know, but sure enough, it was like Will Ferrell or whatever, but I just went to that open casting and I got trying, I tried out and got the role as like a kind of an extra, I boxed out Will Ferrell for the game winner. And then like, I was, a uh, you know, I'm in that last scene. I hit like a three or something like that with Andre 2000 and them. But I learned, I learned a lot from that too. And then over the years, I always dabbled. I had like little roles where it's like one line here, play myself in this movie or that. And um, even now I'm trying to produce a film, trying to do something more, you know, uh, more of a role, like a bigger role. Is that where you start liking the acting and, and liking being on film sets and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, really go all the way back to, to the and one days when I did I did that movie and then like we were doing commercials every second. So like there was like 10 to 15, 20 and one commercials we did. So I got used to being on a set and when they say action, kind of like learn the cadence for that. And so, yeah, I love it. I, do, I love even just producing, bringing projects together, entertainment. Even for me now, like I'm an editor, I'm very in on production and all that. So, um, when when Ann One was at its top level, 
Name them sponsors y'all had. Oh yeah, Mountain Dew, Go Red, uh, EA Sports. Yeah, yeah. We what, had the game. What, what? 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 Yeah. So you, Ubisoft, Activision did the, did the Animal Street Ball PS2 game. We had the Lave, what? Code Red Army, uh, Boost Mobile. We had the Boost Mobile commercial. We had uh, Boost Mobile. We did commercials for the video. There's several video games that commercials for um, Old Spice. Like the swagger, or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, the spawn, but you know, later I we never really knew the business, but about 07 08, I overheard them saying the tours were like 50 to 80 million dollar tours. You know, what I mean, the sponsorship was crazy. Now, did you all get a piece of that pie though? Uh, I don't know what our salaries were paid from. Maybe it was sponsorship, maybe it was uh, and one profits, but. You know, by the last three or four years, I had a I had a multi six figure contract. My last like three years, and probably some of the headliner dudes. I imagine Hot Sauce, mm-hmm. big deal, and uh, some of these other guys. But yeah, so the the salaries started to go up, and I think that's why the OGs are rubbed wrong because when we when the company got bought out the same day, I got the cover of Sports Illustrated. It's like actually behind me, the cover of Sports Illustrated back here. The same day, somebody put that in my hands. It was the same day corporate, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and told me like, yo, the company's been bought out. Just just letting y'all know. Yeah. And then I remember I was like, what does that mean? And main event and I, we asked them if you still got a job, everything good. And they're like, yeah, everything's the same. It's just, you know, new ownership. But it really wasn't the same. You know what I mean? Wow. We went to Japan a couple weeks later <laughs> and we got called in the back room while we were in Japan. And people people who were running sponsorship kind of told us like, hey, the tour is about to end. The new regime and one don't want to do it. And, uh, Y'all got to come with me because we're going to do our own TV show with our own sponsorship. It's going to be great. And my manager at the time, he told me not to sign that contract. He's like, because he's like, wait, he's like, you don't want to leave ESPN. He's like, you want to leave ESPN? So, so I didn't, I didn't sign the deal. Hot Sauce didn't sign the deal and neither did Escalade. And then it turned out, and one did want to do the tour. The new regime still wanted to do the tour, still got the TV show. So it wasn't really true. And so what happened was, once the, sponsors, mm. once the sponsors found out, that whole regime went out of business quick. And so the OGs were kind of like left out. And it was messed up because they built it, you know what I'm saying? And then like a few years yep. in, they were out of it. So I, I actually do, I actually understand their stance and being like kind of upset how the things yeah. went. So that's why when they did that doc recently at 30 for 30, I wasn't on there because they wanted the narrative to be remembered for how it started and not how it ended. I, I think the, the market probably wanted the full story, but... I, I get it. You know what I'm saying? They were upset because they, they were kind of, they were done wrong. So well, what you've learned from the and one stuff and your experiences has led you to start Global Hooper. Go. How did that get started? Where did the logo come up at? Where did you say, I want to start my own damn brand? Yeah. So this was about like and one had been over for about three or four years. And I started Instagram, I think 2011, a girl showed me Instagram and I I always had learned from branding that evolving and changing, you know, all over time is a big part of it too. You got to kind of like reinvent yourself. So I called myself the global Hooper on Instagram for about four or five years. And then later people were connecting the dots. They were still calling me professor. So I switched my Instagram back to professor and like my YouTube was always professor live. So it just made sense. And then when I finally got out of all my deals, no more ball up, no more and one because people weren't doing the marketing right. And I was learning so much. I could pinpoint where things went wrong. And I was like, oh, man, you're supposed to be doing this. And it got to the point where I knew more about the marketing side than the companies that were approaching me with, with endorsement deals. So it just made sense. It's like God showing me, like, yo, it's time to do your own thing. Like, duh. You know what I mean? So so I started Global Hooper, uh, I think, 2016. Didn't, it didn't come to life till 2017. But called it Global Hooper because that's what I did. In between and one and ball up, like I just played in like one off games all over the world because and one was so global, people don't even know. Even when and one was dead, two thousand eight to two, you know, two thousand, you know, all the way up until now, like it was always hot overseas because they don't know they don't know the story. They they think it's still going crazy. You can last longer overseas because media wasn't as high, so they don't keep up with the narrative the same, and they hang right. on to things longer. So I would I played in like and one Russia. I played in and one Brazil. My very last game I ever did was in An One Angola, and so so yeah, I just started my own brand, Global Hooper, because I would always play these games, and that's that was like the name that came to mind. I think it was just meant to be, and 
and, and give our listeners uh, what type of flavor you got in the global hooper uh, items. I mean, is it because we know your we know your swag and your style. Like you said, you was younger. You was wearing the the, the big Jordan shirts and stuff like that. But what, what's your what's your item list like? What you what you got? Yeah. So so global hooper is basketball streetwear. So I feel like go, going into a brand trying to compete with the big dog. Like eventually, I want this to be a culture brand. But I'm trying to set myself up from the get go. And be more of like what a ball player would wear in his off time. Not that we still don't. We make a few basketball shorts and shirts, stuff like that you can hoop in. But it's really basketball streetwear because I like how like Supreme is the top of the game. They're like a brand and they're really rooted in skating, but they're kind of like everything. It's like streetwear, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like skate streetwear. So we nobody ever owned that lane, but we're, we're like Hooper streetwear. So that's what it is. But uh, it could be anything from what you would just wear. It's kind of like a, it's a streetwear brand, really. You know what I mean? But kind of like relates to Hoopers. I like that. To fit their lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we take, we take inspiration from like, obviously Nike being the first sports lifestyle brand, but like Nike Supreme, uh, Palace, a lot of those brands we draw inspiration from. Man, I got, I got to ask you this because your brand is huge. Who, who came up with the disguises and the skits and the, you know, when you out there, man, like you got on, you know, these all these different characters from Spider-Man to, you know, I, I even saw one where you was Bugs Bunny and you had Lola Bunny out there hooping with you. I'm like, OK, what, who, who comes up with these ideas? So me and my team, A1, bro, we, I, my team is awesome. And it all goes back to 2011. Uh, sorry. It goes back to 2013 when my homie, this, dude, this dude's name, uh, Robin Rowe, a.k.a. I am Seth Freeze, super cool cat. But he's the one who taught me actually how to use a DSLR and really how to do YouTube on a higher level. And the reason we did cosplay, mm-hmm. it might seem random to some people. And I know even in the previous generation, that would have been like corny, but like cosplay got so big. Like we put out Spider-Man, the first ever Spider-Man basketball episode one. It has 50 million views today. But like in the first week, it had like six or seven mil and that was like crazy viral. And that's what blew up my channel to another level. And so my homie was innovative. He was like, man, cosplay going crazy, bro. He's like, have you ever thought about trying to do a viral swing? And I was like, nah, like, what do you mean? You know what I mean? I didn't know what that was. So we ordered, you know, we got a Spider-Man costume. The Spider-Man covered uh, the body head to toe. He's like, you should do a prank. You should go to the park dressed as a superhero. He said, this will be, this will be prank. This will be sports. This will be cosplay. This will be humor. All these things at one, that's how you make a viral swing, right? So I went and played, and it was God's plan, bro. I, the, the suit I ordered fit me like a glove, like for some reason. You know, most people right? And then I played for 20 minutes. I didn't miss a shot. I didn't – every move worked. I didn't miss a shot. And then, like, I go to the car, and, you know, we finish it in, like, 25 minutes, and I edited it, put that joint out, and it literally I had a million subs, like, overnight. A million subs overnight. You edit it. You edit it yourself. Yeah, I always learned to be an editor ever since I was on YouTube. Really, of the '06, I just had my own channel. Started my own channel '09, and I had this dude who was making these, mm. these fan professor mixes. He grabbed from the ESPN clips. They were doing like one, two million a video, and so I he he taught me how to edit. He lives in San Diego, so I just learned it from the ground up because I knew I had to come up with something after and one, and I knew that. YouTube, mm. I knew I didn't know how big it would be, but I knew that it was like the new wave. It's basically like. I'm like, this is free distribution. This is your own TV channel. And I knew at the time it was in like 10 countries. And so it was growing. So I was getting bookings from YouTube. Because back in the day, you could you could get a YouTube DM. You know what I'm saying? They had they had DMs back then. But Damn. yeah, so I learned it from the ground up. And then like doing Space Jam, even as of recently, we did the Space Jam series. It's actually like uh, eight of those videos. But it's just a way to be creative and do something different because, like, YouTube is so saturated. If you start your video on a check ball, playing ball, not that we still don't do that, mm-hmm. too, but, like, you're only going to get so many views, you know what I mean? Like, unless you have a trash talk moment or some controversy, you're only going to do so good. So that's the swing mm-hmm. at, like, doing something way different. And we never really thought of it, right? Like, look at the reason Space Jam is so hot is because you're seeing both. Like, you'd like to see them characters hoop. Like, it's just... It's like you're bringing sports in that character and you're doing this crazy mashup that's never been done. It's basically what Looney Tunes, Warner Brothers did with Looney yeah. Tunes. So we, we're doing stuff like that on YouTube and I think there's high appeal in that. And it also hits the kids really hard too. There's a wide demographic for it. So 
that's tend to work and it's just it's just a way to drive millions and millions of views as opposed to like a couple hundred thousand per bit. So that's kind of where that came from. It's it was strategic marketing play, and then I just learned yeah. to like it. We did we did Spider Man thinking it was gonna be a prank. We just thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. But then the kids and the way it was received, they were like, Oh, they're like, That's crazy. They're like, That's a soft that's fire right there. Like we just thought it was funny, you know what I'm saying? We didn't know how it'd be received. Well, everybody was trying to figure out who it was. That was that was the thing. You know, we yeah. we didn't we didn't know it was you at first. And then that's what we learned too, is like with YouTube, I learned a lot about marketing. People only remember things at a glance, right? Because you could have saw it was on my channel and you could have added up it was me. But then also everybody took that and it got memed, it got memed out, it went on every platform. It went on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it went on Instagram, it went on Vine back in the day, it went on Twitter. And so then people made their own vids. You don't know who it was. But I learned that was actually a good thing, right? Like mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. people yeah. take my vids and meme it out. I'm like, oh, that was a good one. They, they wanted to meme it. That was, and okay. you know what I love that you're doing now is that you're like answering the calls now. Because everybody want to challenge the professor. Yeah. You're like, come on. Who next? Come on. Like, I, I love those videos. We can't wait. We can't wait for the controversy. That's why you don't really see me saying nothing. I can't wait. I'm like, I'm hoping you play because this is going to be a great hit. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, I used to be like, yo, y'all too much. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like stomach in and egos today. If that would have happened before, I'd be like, mm -hmm. I might have still played, but it depends what mood I'm in. You know what I mean? So, but now we're waiting for it. You know what I'm saying? We can't, we can't wait for that to happen. You know, if it goes good, sometimes it go like a storybook. A joint looks fake. You know what I mean? But like, Basketball, you always go find people who think they're better than they are, right? That's a forever thing. Everybody thinks they're better than they are. I don't care who you are. Do you have a best one-on-one -on -one trash talker who wanted to to test the professor? Do you have one that sticks out? He's like, yeah, I was I'm, I was waiting for this mofo right here. I'm ready to give it to him. Well, the, the biggest video on my YouTube channel actually is 80 million views, and it's, it's my first ever trash talk video. I remember... I didn't know what to call the dude when I was upload. I called him the trash talker. Now it's like a trend. But he wasn't even really a hooper like that. Maybe he used to be, but he had put on a bunch of weight. And like he had this like button up shirt and he had on some like running shoes or something like some khaki shorts and running shoes. And it was spring break. Made him be drinking. I don't know. But basically he was talking to me crazy when I was hooping in Laguna Beach. And he was telling people like, man, all you got to do is watch his hips. Man, you're doing too much. He's like, all you got to do is watch his hips. <laughs> And then he somehow it segued and he's like, man, I'll bust his ass if I was playing. Boom. I was like, all right, let's play after this then. How about that? You know? And I suggested it and somehow we matched up and uh, I crossed him one time and he hit the deck. He hit the pavement like hard. Like I didn't yeah. touch him. This, yeah. is, this was yeah. no contact ankle breaker. And then two plays later, like the next play, I crossed him. His dude broke his shoulder. He like threw his shoulder out. And so the game just ended. And it looked like a storybook, you know what I mean? Because, like, he talked all that trash. I ain't say nothing when he came in. And then he got served. And um, I remember uh, I told a story. I, that edit, I did different. I told the story why we played the game because some people online would say, like, oh, you don't play people who are good competition when really it's like, no, yo, a bunch of high competition videos. And I just play anybody. I don't even care. You know what I'm saying? So I did the story, the story in the lead up and called him a trash talker you know, to show how it came about, to show why I played this dude. I didn't just choose a fat dude with the, the button up, you know what I mean? So, but then I learned that's the way you got to do every video. You got to tell a story to how it ends up. It's such a better watch than if you just start the video with the check ball, which a lot of influencers do because it's easy. Right. So I did it by default. I didn't even be marketing strategic. And then we had the thumbnail. I was like, I did the body thumbnail when he's on the ground. I zoomed into that and I'm like, yo, and then we called him a trash. So we did everything right that we do now. Now we strategically go for that only. But with back then, I accidentally, it was God's plan. I accidentally did everything right. The shit that you've gone through, your real life experiences, people have to go to school for that type of shit. Yeah, exactly. We learned it the, the hard way. Do you know what I'm saying? Like everything that then happened to you that you didn't learn for editing, people go to, to school for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, self taught. And I, and I, I, I got to give my credit to some of my team. They've showed me a lot. Like I partner now with this dude, this dude, Jay Lyons, who does a lot of my, if you see some of my vids on my channel look like a TV show or like a movie, those are usually the ones he does. Ours are more like blog style. Mm -hmm. So he's taught me a lot, but yeah, you're right. Learning even the business side. I didn't own the name, the professor trademark until 2017 or 2016, something like that. 
So I, it took me forever to gain that, you know, learn the legal ramifications behind trademarking and all that. So, yeah, it's kind of like a blessing. It, it was annoying learning these things the hard way, but, you know, experience is the best teacher, right? So I'm glad you say that. We didn't even get to ask you that question. And plus, man, we just want to thank you so much, man. I know we've taken up so much of your time. Oh, no, I'm loving you, bro. I'm honored we to be on. a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Oh, man, that's our oh, honor. <laughs> but uh, I, I, we didn't ask you, how did you get the name, Professor? Oh, shout out to the best MC of all time, Duke Tango. So Duke Tango gave the name to Skip to My Lou. He gave the name to Main Event. He gave the name to Escalade. Half man, half amazing. He's just a beast, bro. And, and honestly, like, I feel like Duke is as dope of an MC as, like, you know, the let's get ready to rumble dude. He, he like, on that level, but better. And I love that on Uncle Drew, they used him as the MC in that movie because he's so dope. He's the best MC I've ever heard. But back in the street ball days, basically, he, he started MCing at Rucker, I think, in the 70s or 80s. When Ann One started to do their tour, they brought him as the main MC. And he gave me my name. He said I was schooling people on the court. And I think it worked so well because I think he thought I looked like a professor. He used to comb my hair to the side. And so like, I think he thought I had to look. It just stamped. I got to give him a, a lot of credit. You know, like, I love Duke. If I can include him in things, I always do. So, Shout out there. Hey, I like Duke, but I like Hannibal. Well, Hannibal, but they're all dope, right? All, all them really smooth. Shout out Hannibal. Shout out, uh, oh, there's other dudes. My my main man, I can't remember his name right now. I'm blinking. There's a, there's a bunch of dope ones, though, man. They're all really good, but. Hey, this I love Hannibal's one on when Kobe Bryant come to the league. Mommy, I guarded Kobe Bryant. He shot it in my face. Yeah, <laughs> you know, even the West Coast dudes are dope. Shout out to uh, Mouthpiece and shout out to PB. They're really dope. Yeah, yeah, you know, he killed that one with Kobe. We called him like AKA Lord of the Rings. I thought that was that was crazy. Man, we want we want to thank you for being on the Hoop Dreams podcast. Honor, I got one final question for you. My man, AG, got one final question for you. With everything that is going on with you and basketball, and I know that you are very happy and satisfied with the way, because I keep hearing you use that thing, you know, how God has really guided and steered your life, and I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, my question for you, though, is did the world get to see the best of the professor of Grayson, or did we miss something? Oh, you talking about on the court? You talking about play wise? Mm -hmm. I think now they get to see it on YouTube. You know what I mean? I think with An One, it's it's funny because people will say like they'll always say like the prime was An One, but they're what they're really saying is when the most people saw you at once. At least that's their opinion, right? I think my audience right. figured now. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I never actually got to be on the the mainstream narrative at my highest, you know, but I got better, you know, with and one, I was only, by the time it ended, I was only 24, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I feel like I came into my prime later. I was probably in my, you know what I mean? But I feel like I'm in my prime now, which is weird, but I don't play as much as the NBA players. So the body doesn't get run down as much, right? 82 games a season is crazy, plus summer and all that. So I feel like, uh, I feel like they do now on YouTube. I think that's where I would leave that, but I didn't get to play in a league or anything at my prime because streetball had a weird reputation. I was very young. And it was just hard, you know, and, and I was still learning. I was good. You know, I, as a child, I got rang into my head that I wasn't an elite player and that elite looked different and you got to be strong. And it wasn't for me. So I was learned late. that I was, I was actually good. I was D1 ready, but I just didn't know it. Like My last question for you, man, we're going to get you out of here on this. What's the next chapter in, in the professor's hoop dream? So the next chapter in, in, in the hoop dream uh, for me is... I'm producing, I'm trying to produce a couple of films. I think it's a little early to speak on, but we're trying to do that. So we're trying to go more into acting. Uh, we got this content studio I'm at right now that I definitely want to have you guys at. If you guys ever come to LA, I haven't launched it yet. It's not on the channel, but we, we're, we're weeks away from that. I'm super excited about that. I started my own vlog squad. It's like people I'm going to collab with on my channel. It's really dope. A few influencers are going to announce that in the coming weeks. Really excited about just endless content stuff, you know, that's coming forth. We're trying to take Global Hooper to new levels. A lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline, but also even more PR, trying to be more part of the mainstream narrative of things and through maybe starting a podcast and a few other things. But uh, when is that book coming out? Good question, bro. 
Good question. You know, I always felt like I couldn't land on what – there's so many ways to go with it. I, I think like God never really gave me the vision for what exactly the topic would be going uh, for a book. But in the near future, I'll just say that. My main hub for all things, my YouTube channel, Professor Live. Check us out Facebook, Professor Live. Global Hooper, globalhooper.com. And then I'm on all short-form platforms as the professor. You know why I got to give you so much love too, man? Besides the fact that you was an incredible ball player. But you was right, man. You was so small, but your shorts used to come down <laughs> to your ankles, man. I said, he got on the biggest uniform. <laughs> Did you know how it was? Hey, that right. 2000s era, I, I actually didn't like it. If my if my shorts wasn't touching my shin or almost my socks, I didn't like them. You know what I mean? The, the, bag, the baggier you were, the harder it was. You know what I mean? That's so right. I, just, I thought that was hard. And when I do the moves... You know how it was? Hot sauce inspired me. If your shirt or your shorts went flying in the air, you did the move like that was hot. You know what I'm saying? So I that's like, right. That's right. All you saw was this, though. Every time you make a move, got to pull that, got to pull that strap back up. Got to pull it back up. <laughs> that was so funny, bro. That was so funny. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. Know I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office, and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha AG. I'm box office, and one day they gon' have to pay me. Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur A.G., Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, with audio engineering from Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me, yeah. I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreamin', trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah.